-hmm. Because the thing that's missing from the to-do list is when you are going to do it. So by having that time in your calendar, when you know this is important for me and you're not measuring yourself by, did I finish? Now, this is super, super important. Mm -hmm. You do not measure yourself by whether you finished. I don't care if you finished. Okay. What I want Mm. you to do instead is to measure yourself based on one thing and one thing only. Did I work on what I said I was going to work on or did I do what I said I was going to do for as long as I said I would without distraction? That's it. That's the only criteria. It doesn't matter if you finish. It's simply, did I do what I said I was going to do for as long as I said I would without distraction? Why? Here's the kicker. Welcome to the Inspired Evolution. And it is such a treat to be here today. We have with us Nir Eyal. Nir, how are you, brother? I'm doing so well. Thanks for having me. Oh, man, it is such a pleasure to have you here. For those tuning into Nir for the first time, he's an author, lecturer, investor, known for his best selling book, Hooked how to build habit forming products. But uh, he also recently wrote a book called Indistractable, how to basically control your attention and choose your life. And this is a conversation that's really present for me. It's uh, going and diving deep into your work has actually helped me with my focus a great deal. So yeah, it's a real treat to have you here today, even if it is just for my bias self, but I trust that the audience is going to get a lot out of this too. Thank you so much for doing this with us, brother. Of course, of course. My pleasure. Thanks. Um, So I wanted to quickly just dive in straight from there. Like, you know, you wrote Hooked, you wrote Indistractable. Um, There's probably a politer way of asking this at the risk of getting you offside from the outset. What is your obsession with human attention? Is that your obsession and where does it come from? (laughs) Oh, that is that is definitely my obsession. Uh, I think it's just fascinating. I think personally, it probably started for me when uh, I was a child, I struggled with obesity. So I used to be clinically obese uh, from an early age and uh, I didn't. Uh, and, and I mean, like, not just overweight, but like actually yeah, well, obese. I remember my, my parents today, taking looking me. at you like that is. Oh, thanks. Wood. I appreciate oh. it. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, thankfully, I, 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 I took action. Uh, and, and, but, but I still struggle with it. I mean, I still have to think about my weight. I mean, today I'm 44 years old. I'm in the best shape of my life, but you know, what I realized, uh, fr- from an early age, uh, is that there's no area of your life that doesn't require you to be able to focus your attention whether it's your physical health, your mental health, your professional well-being, uh, your relationships, all these things require you to be able to control your attention. I mean, how we spend our time is how we spend our life. Uh, and so if you let other people control your attention, control your time, uh, you, you don't live the kind of life that you know you deserve. And so I think that's where the fascination started for me is that at one mm-hmm. point in my life, uh, I felt controlled by food. And no. uh, it wasn't until I got to the bottom of, of what was controlling me that it actually wasn't the food. It was my relationship with the food. It was how I was dealing with food in my life. And I think that there's a very similar metaphor for um, how we deal with information and how we deal with all the d- potential distractions in our environment. I think it probably started from that early age and carries over until this very day. Man, thank you so much for explaining that. And I've heard you put it as in like... um. Uh, somewhere along the lines, I was researching your work and it said, we are what we pay attention to. And I just love the, I love how, yeah, it just, it just really zend it out and simplified it for me. And at the risk of having already unpacked the answer to the next question, which is like, and it's almost, and I, it comes across as lame, but for those that are tuning in, I have to ask this question, like, why is what we pay attention to important? I know you've covered some ground there, but I have to ask this question from the outside, like, why is it so important? what we're paying attention to. I think people that have are somewhat self-aware understand the importance of this mm-hmm. question, but for some people that question is is a question, yeah? Yeah, no, it's it's a terrific question. And I can't take credit for that quote, by the way, that was William James, the father of modern psychiatry, who who mm-hmm. coined that phrase. And it. uh, it's, it's, it's very true. It's, uh, you know, if we allow our time and attention to be ma- manipulated by others, uh, they will have us do and pay attention to what they want versus what we want. And so mm-hmm. I, I think actually a really good place to answer that question is to understand what is distraction. Uh, and the best way to understand what is distraction is to understand what is the opposite of distraction. So most people, if you ask them, what's the opposite of distraction, they'll tell you it's focus. Mm-hmm. That's not exactly right. That the opposite of distraction, if you look at the origin of the word, it comes from the re- Latin root trahare, which means to pull. 
So, and they both, and, and the word distraction shares a common root with the word traction. So we have traction and distraction. Mm. So the opposite of distraction is not focus, it's traction. So what is traction? Traction is any action. You notice that both traction and distraction mm, have the same the word six action. letter word at the end, A-C-T-I-O-N, yeah. right? Action is at the base of those two words. Traction is any action that pulls you towards what you said you were going to do with your time and attention, right? Things that you do with intent. Mm -hmm. The opposite of traction, of course, distraction is any action that pulls you away from what you plan to do. Things that are not in accordance with your values, things that pull you further away from the kind of life you know you deserve. Um, so, so it's very important to make that distinction for a few reasons. Number one, I would argue that any action can be an act of traction if it's what you've decided to do with your time in advance. So a lot of times we hear people moralizing and medicalizing behaviors and they feel all guilty and ashamed of their behaviors. But I think we need to stop doing that because, mm. you know, who am I, who are you to tell people, oh, you know, uh, uh, playing video games, that's somehow morally inferior to watching football on TV. Mm -hmm. uh, why is social media any different from, you know, calling friends on the phone? There, there's, mm -hmm. there's not necessarily a difference unless it's not what you plan to do. Right. So if it's, it's crept in across the boundary do, of, yeah. Exactly. If, if you want to watch Netflix, you know, stop guilting people out about yeah. Netflix or yeah. playing video games or doing anything you want. You want to go on Pinterest or you scroll the web. These tools are wonderful. And I think we need to stop moralizing and medicalizing these things mm -hmm. and to tell people, look, this is perfectly normal, fine behavior. There's nothing broken about you that the fact that you like these things, don't be, mm -hmm. be, feel guilty about it, but rather do it with intent. Do it on your schedule, not someone else's. The other side of the coin is that many times we think that things that uh, are work related, right, are somehow yeah. not distractions. For example, I would sit down at my desk day after day and I would yeah. say, okay, now I'm going to start uh, my day. I've got this to-do list that's a million miles long. By the way, we can talk about why to-do lists are one of the worst <laughs> things you can do for your personal productivity. We can get back to that later. Yeah. But I would have this long to-do list of things that I was going to do. And I would say, okay, I'm going to get started. I'm not going to delay. I'm not going to get distracted. Here I go. I'm going to get started right now. But first, let me check some email, <laughs> right? Let me just do that easy task on my to-do list just to get the ball rolling, right? Just to get started. And what I didn't yeah. realize is that that is, in fact, the worst kind of distraction, mm -hmm. the distraction that tricks you into prioritizing the urgent and the easy work at the expense yeah. of the hard and important work that moves your life and career forward. So just because it's a work-related task, right? Just because I'm checking email, that's something mm -hmm. I need to do for work. If it's not what you said you were going to do, it is a distraction. So that's the most dangerous kind of distraction, the distraction that you don't even realize is happening to you because you justified it in your brain saying, well, I got to do it at some point. I got to clean the house. I got to take out the trash. I got to do this. I got to do that. And what you really needed to do was the thing you said you were going to do in do advance. It. And that's why it's so important to find traction or distraction, because if you don't define that for your life, you're going to be pulled in a million different directions based on interests outside your own. And you're, you're going to live a life of regret. You're going to look back and say, why didn't I exercise when I had the chance? Why didn't I spend more time with my family? Why didn't I work on that big project? Why didn't I do the things I knew I was capable of? Why? Because you didn't manage distraction. And that's why we have to become indistractable. I love that. And well, hmm. I do. Love, I, love, I love that you've summarized it so articulately. Thank you so much for sharing it that way. But part of me, actually, when I, I remember when I first tuned into this, the piece where you started sharing, like, yeah, even the little niggly work tasks, which you think are like, yeah. what, like you, you, I used to justify them as warm up tasks. <laughs> it's yeah. like, I'm warming up to getting some cadence and then I'll get my head in the game and then I'll start doing it. And sometimes, like, I don't only have an hour to do a task. And then, like you, like you describe in your book, I spend about 30 minutes on the warm up task. And then I'm looking at, like, oh, there's right. only 30 minutes left. Right. I might just go get a coffee. <laughs> Just yeah, put it exactly, up. exactly, you know, exactly. Like, I'll, do, I'll come back when I've got more time, and it's like, damn it, that's the. And I think therein lies like that real distillation, the difference between, yeah, we evangelize focus, but then also like you know, it's okay to be defocused from the meta, like meta view of your life, like zooming out, as long as that was what you intended to do. Like it's important to take some time to decompress, sure. to relax, to unwind. Right. It's a healthy part of being a human, right? Relaxing your nervous system, getting back into the parasympathetic, all necessary. And, you know, even allowing focus to come in, like in my downtime, one of my key things is playing the guitar, right? Like I absolutely love it and allowing that to right. sort of just, and bringing focus to that. But the key word being traction. And I remember like when I first came across, like it was a penny drop moment um, mm. for me when you were like, there's distraction and then there's traction and anything that's pulling you mm. closer to where you want to go 
is traction. Everything else that is like sort of taking you away from that is distraction. Now in there, like there's a few, you know, and I'll be the first person to put my hand up and I'm sure those that are tuning in, you might be able to relate. Um, We kind of know sometimes what we're, well, sometimes most of the time what we should be doing Mm-hmm. but we we don't really execute on that. So we can, I kind of know what is the traction activity, but I still don't adhere to it. So I guess the question is right. more along the lines of what is the root cause of the distraction then? Um, that right. you have this, is, this, is, this is the most important question, right? This is, this mm-hmm. is critical. I, I would challenge a bit what you said in terms of that we know what we're supposed to be doing. I think most people don't know. Right. And most people, when it comes to, in general, they have these aspirations, right? I mm-hmm. want to live a healthy life. I want to have good mental health. I want to have good relationships. I want to take care of my body. I want to have good spiritual, uh, a spiritual connection. They have these aspirations, mm-hmm. but they don't know how to spend their time. Right. Yes. And if you don't right. plan your day, mm-hmm. somebody's going to plan it for you. Mm-hmm. If you don't plan your day, somebody's going to plan for you. So that is actually a super important step. It's called setting an implementation intention in the psychology literature, which has been shown to be the most effective thing you can do for your time management is to simply decide in advance what you are going to do with your time. Because here's the thing. You can't call something a distraction unless you know what it distracted you from. Let me say that again. You can't call something a distraction unless you know what it distracted you from. So if you have a big empty calendar with nothing on it, you're not distracted. <laughs> You're not distracted because what did you get distracted from? You just got a bunch of white space. We said, oh, but I need my creativity time. I need time to be spontaneous. I can't uh-huh. plan my day. Okay, that's for children and retirees. Mm. For adults who want to get more out of their life. Look, and if you're perfectly contented with your life, if everything's going according to plan, if, if everything's hunky-dory and you know that you're living to your full potential, this is not the podcast episode Happy for days. you. Okay? <laughs> right? But if you know, like I knew, that there was yeah. more I could do with my life, if mm-hmm. I could simply focus on the things that I said I was going to do mm-hmm. for myself, if you're that kind of person, you have got to plan your time. Okay, mm-hmm. which means keeping a time box calendar. And by the way, that time can be filled with whatever you want. You want to play the guitar, you want to practice yoga, you want to watch TV, you mm-hmm. want to play video games. I don't care. It doesn't mm-hmm. matter what you do. What matters is that you do what you said you would do, mm-hmm. right? And the, and at the time you said you would, because what happens is for the vast majority of us, we say we're going to journal. We say mm-hmm. we're going to exercise. We say we're going to spend time with our family. We say we're going to write that book. We say we're going to do whatever it is we say we're going to do, but let me just do this one thing real quick. Mm-hmm. Right. I need a break. I need to, mm-hmm. you know, it's important to, 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 to have some time to re-energize. It is, but not because of what we call an internal trigger. These, this mm-hmm. is the answers to your question here around why is it that when we know what to do, we mm-hmm. don't do it. Mm-hmm. And by the way, this is not a new question. Many people say, oh, it's because the technology is distracting us. The technology is hijacking <sighs> our brains. Bullshit. Bullshit. Yeah. And I'll tell you why it's bullshit. Because 2,500 years ago, before the internet, well, before, 2,500 years before the internet, Plato, the Greek philosopher, was describing the exact same phenomenon. Phenomenon. He called it akrasia. It's the tendency to do things against our better interests. People have been struggling with distraction since recorded history. This has yeah, always wow. been a problem. And every generation complains about, oh, my God, this is melting my brain. That's melting my brain. Excuses. <laughs> rubbish. I'm not saying it's easy. Yeah. And I'm not saying it's your fault. It's not yeah. your fault. You didn't invent Facebook. You didn't invent Instagram. It's not your fault but it is your responsibility. You know why? Because nobody's going to fix it for you. Nobody's going to fix it for you. The companies are not going to make these products less engaging. The geniuses in government aren't going to regulate this away. This is part of living in the modern world. And you know what? It's a blessing. It's wonderful that we have the world's information at our fingertips. It's amazing that we can connect with people all around the world instantly. It's amazing that we have these technologies, but you know what? The price of progress Mm. is that you have to learn how to use these things to your advantage so they don't use you, starting with understanding why we get distracted in the first place. So we get distracted because of two kinds of triggers. Mm -hmm. The first kind of trigger is one everybody knows and they blame for. It's called an external triggers. Mm -hmm. External triggers are the pings, the dings, the rings, anything in our outside environment that can lead us towards distraction, right? You see this every day, right? When your phone rings, when... uh, (laughs) 
every when your when your kid knocks on the door and you're in a business meeting, whatever. Yeah, my you, favorite excuse is burn. Yeah, all those external triggers they do lead to distraction, no doubt about it. Yeah. But studies find, get this, studies find they only account for ten percent of the times we get distracted. Ten percent. Yeah. So it is a cause of distraction. Mm-hmm. It's not the number one cause by a long uh, a cause by a long shot. Yeah. The number one cause of distraction studies find are not the external triggers. It's the internal triggers. What are internal triggers? Internal triggers are uncomfortable emotional states that we seek to escape. Boredom, loneliness, fatigue, uncertainty, stress, anxiety. When we feel these uncomfortable emotional states and we don't know how to deal with them in a healthy way that leads us towards traction, what most people do, they escape these sensations with distraction. So when you're lonely, check mm. Facebook. When you're uncertain, Google. When you're bored, oh, there's a million solutions to boredom, right? Check the news, stock prices, sports scores, a million different things that we can take our mind off, off of that uncomfortable sensation. So here's the big takeaway. For my mm-hmm. five years of research, what I learned was that time management is pain management. Let me say that again. Time management is pain management. If we don't know how to deal with that discomfort, we will always find distraction because again, people have been struggling with distraction for at least the past 2,500 years. So whether it's too much news, too much booze, too much football, too much Facebook, if you don't know how to deal with that uncomfortable sensation, that emotion, you're going to get distracted. So the first step is Mm. to deal with that emotional discomfort in a healthy way that leads you towards traction rather than trying to escape it with distraction. That's the most important first step. Man, that, that was a big real, like, it was almost uncomfortable that I had to read this a few times when I was going through your book as well, which was the fact that contentment is not necessarily part of our evolution, you know? Mm-hmm. And I started actually sort of looking just at the, like the social sort of layout of the world. It's like, yeah, those that are like, I don't want to say in hustle mode because I don't want to evangelize mm-hmm. the hustle. Right. But those that are out there that are hungry, that are achieving are obviously the ones that are propagating. <laughs> and those are the ones that are propagating more. And obviously that's get handed down. And then, you know, you have this propagation of kind of achievement, you know, and then it's like, oh, yeah. no, like, yeah, I don't see the content, you know, sort of winning the race in some right. ways, which is unfortunate. Right. But then it, it really, it really lay it in for me. It was like, oh, so, and I think, uh, again, I'm using the word evangelize probably a bit too much, but you did evangelize sort of coming to comfort with dissatisfaction in your book. It's right. sort of like this prerequisite for like, hey, if you're really going to make progress in this space, get comfortable with the fact that you're going to be dissatisfied. And you're going to be right. uncomfortable. There's going to be right. things that are like these internal triggers. And as uncomfortable as it was to hear that you're going to be uncomfortable, it does normalize it a little bit, right? You talked a little bit about acceptance in there. Can you unpack that a little right. bit further for us, bro? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. So what we find with high performers, mm. people who are indistractable, people who do what they say they're going to do, mm. is that they know how to deal with discomfort that low performers, they tend to escape these things, right? Right. They look for something to take their mind off of that discomfort. And many times it Mm -hmm. comes from things outside themselves, right? It's a, it's a drink, it's the television, it's the scroll. It's something that they look for to Mm -hmm. make themselves feel something different. Whereas Mm -hmm. high performers, they also feel the discomfort. It's not that they don't feel it. It's that they use the discomfort differently. So when they feel that discomfort, when they feel bored, lonesome, stressed, anxious, they use it as rocket fuel to propel them forward towards traction, right? They use it to push them further. When you talk to these, you know, amazing athletes who have these uh, difficult family situations, they're trying to prove something to the world. When you talk to artists, when you talk to uh, authors, when you talk to people who who are high performers, Mm. they're typically using that discomfort to benefit them, to push them forward. And they know how to deal with that discomfort in a healthy way, as opposed to many of us, maybe most of us, we use that discomfort and we try and escape it as quickly as possible. Oh, I don't want to feel bored. Let me turn on the TV. Oh, I don't want to feel lonely. Let me check social media. Oh, I, don't, I don't want to feel these uncomfortable things. So we look for the closest solution to take our mind off that discomfort. And so what we have to start with is, is getting rid of this ridiculous notion that somehow if we're not content, we're broken. And I think this is a real disservice that the self-help industry has has told us uh, that you're supposed to be happy. Mm. You're not supposed to be happy, at least not for very long. Happiness and contentment is supposed to be a fleeting sensation. You're mm. not supposed to be content. By the way, this is the core message of Buddhism. 
<laughs> and this is nothing. I didn't invent this uh, revelation, no. but I think in modern society, we've we've uh, we, we've sold this ridiculous ideal that uh, if you're not, you know, zenned out and perfectly content, that something's wrong with you. And that is mm. nothing could be further from the truth. Let's think about it from an evolutionary basis. Yeah. If there was ever a group of homo sapiens mm -hmm. that was content all the time, our ancestors would have killed and eaten them. <laughs> it makes no sense to be contented. Why? Because discontent is what pushes us forward. That's what causes us, uh, pushes us to create and invent and strive to make the world a better place. So discontentment is a good thing. It's what mm. makes the world better, right? Why, why would we improve things if we were already contented with contented everything? With it. Yeah. So it's okay to feel discontent. It's okay to feel bored. It's okay to feel stressed. It's okay to feel lonely. It's about what we do with that discomfort. Do we use that discomfort in a healthy, adaptive way that moves us towards traction? Or do we simply try and escape it with these short-term rewards that just take our mind off of that discomfort and try and numb it with a distraction? And I think that bleeds into my next question because I think, yeah, there's the the image that's sort of coming to my mind is the David Goggins embrace your pain <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> really intensely. But how do we actually deal with the thoughts, the beliefs, and the urges that make us distractible? Yeah. So the internal, so there's four steps to becoming indistractable. The first of which is, is mastering the internal triggers and we have to master those internal triggers or they become our master. And there's about a dozen different techniques I describe in the book. None mm -hmm. of them are original. <laughs> I, yeah. I comb the psychology literature to give you the very best techniques that not only are scientifically supported, but also ones that I use in my day-to-day -day life. I used to be mm -hmm. a very distractible person. And today I would count myself as indistractable. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll give you I'll give you just a couple. One of my favorite techniques, uh, this comes from acceptance and commitment therapy, uh, is called surfing the urge. And so mm -hmm. surfing the urge acknowledges that um, uh, that that strict abstinence oftentimes backfires. What does strict abstinence looks like? I want to ask about this. What's that? <laughs> yeah. No, oh, yeah. sorry. I was, I was excited to. I was excited that you talked about this because I wanted to. Uh, yeah. yeah. Please continue. Sorry. Yeah. So so strict abstinence is when we tell ourselves not to do something. Right. Yeah. Don't watch the television. Don't check social media. <laughs> Don't do it. And what we know is that when you tell yourself not to do something, it elicits mm -hmm. what we call psychological reactance. And psychological reactance is this phenomenon, all of us feel it, mm -hmm. that when you are told what to do, you rebel, all of us. Uh, if your mom ever told you when you were a kid to put on a coat because it's cold outside and you said, don't tell me what to do, right? Like, <laughs> that's that feeling. Your boss micromanages you, right? That feeling of don't tell me what to do, that's <laughs> reactance. Now, here's how weird the human brain is. We feel psychological reactance even when it is us telling ourselves what to do, <laughs> right? And this is why telling yourself not to do something can backfire. So what do you do instead? Mm -hmm. You don't say, no, I can't do it. You say, look, I'm, I'm a grown man or woman. I can do whatever I want, mm -hmm. uh, but I'm not going to give into this distraction right now. I'm going to give into it. And this is called the 10 minute rule. I'm mm -hmm. going to give in to that distraction in 10 minutes. So whether no. it's smoking that cigarette you're trying to quit, whether it's if you're on a diet, you're trying to resist that chocolate cake, whether it's, hey, I'm going to check email, but I want to focus on the task at hand. You can do it. You're mm. a grown man or woman. You can do whatever you want, but not right now. Mm. You can do it in 10 minutes. And so by doing that, you're giving, you're, you're disarming that psychological reactance and giving yourself permission to do whatever it is you want, but in 10 minutes. So what you're doing, you're giving yourself proof, evidence of agency. And this is incredibly important. We know that self-efficacy, the belief that you are powerful. And this is why I, I am so adamantly against this narrative that we see in the popular media today, that technology is hijacking your brain, that it's addicting mm. everybody, that Facebook is controlling your mind. It's nonsense. Mm -hmm. And in fact, it does nothing but make the problem worse. Because yep. when you believe you're powerless, guess what? Mm. It leads to learned helplessness. You don't yeah. do anything about it. Whereas yep. if you prove to yourself and you say, hey, you know what? I can wait 10 minutes to check my email. I just did it, right? And so the 10 minute rule becomes the 11 minute rule, becomes the 12 minute rule, becomes the 15 minute rule. And you're proving to yourself that you can delay gratification a little bit. And you're starting to build that belief in yourself that you're able to do it. Now, what you do during that time is very mm -hmm. important. Okay. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I'll give you a very personal example. So I've been a professional writer now for uh, almost a decade <laughs> and writing is really hard work, right? It never gets easier. It never becomes <laughs> a habit. It's hard. Okay. And all I want to do when I'm writing is go check email or see what's happening in the news or check social media. I'm constantly bombarded by these internal triggers mm -hmm. that I had to learn how to deal with. 
So what do I do when I'm writing and I, I just want to check something real quick. I want to check email or Facebook or whatever. I will tell myself I can give into that temptation in 10 minutes. I'll set a timer on my phone. I'll put it down. And then I have a choice to make. I can either get back to the task at hand. Okay. Mm-hmm. I can get back to writing or I can do what psychologists call surf the urge. Now, surfing the urge is a matter of simply realizing that these internal triggers, these emotions we talked about earlier, and this is a big revelation, you don't control how you feel. Okay, many people don't realize this. You don't control your feelings. All right, when somebody says, calm down, right? You, how many times have we heard yeah, calm down. <laughs> that always works. <laughs> that's worked in the history of mankind. That's never worked. Nobody's ever calmed down because you told them to calm down. Especially you when you start control. telling them to calm down. <laughs> exactly. It's, it's, it makes it worse, right? Why? Because we don't control our urges. We don't control our feelings. How, how can that be, right? Well, think about it. If you feel the urge to sneeze, Okay, Mm -hmm. you can't control the urge to sneeze. You already felt that urge. What you can do is decide how you will respond to that sensation. Hence the term responsibility, right? Mm -hmm. So how you respond to that emotion, that is in your control. How you Mm -hmm. feel is not in your control. How you respond to that sensation is in your control. So that's why we have to have a plan in place. We have to know what we will do when we feel a certain way, and we all learn this, right? When we were young, we used to throw temper tantrums and we would we would respond to our feelings in a way that was very antisocial and not helpful mm-hmm. to people. And then of course we learn over time as we grow up what behaviors are appropriate in, in a social context. And mm-hmm. so we have to do the same thing with our internal triggers. Will we jump to escape every time we feel the slightest tinge of boredom and anxiety and stress? Will we escape that sensation? Or do we learn over time to surf that urge and realize that all human sensations, all of these emotions, these internal triggers, they're like waves. They crest and they subside. You don't stay angry forever. You don't stay bored forever. You don't stay lonely forever. They're like waves. And so if you can ride that sensation like a surfer on a surfboard, and I teach you in the book, Indistractable, how to talk yourself through these sensations and having Mm -hmm. that script in your mind changes the game because now you're not a slave to these sensations. You will use them to propel you forward rather than trying to escape them. And using some of these exercises, thank you so much for sharing that. In using some of these exercises in the book, I have noticed that actually the time spent surfing the urge, um, I call it my bounce back factor, just personally in my own, Mm. like for myself, like my bounce back factor is much, like it gets shorter and shorter over time. So when I watch Mm. like, oh, that's what sort of triggered me and it goes, okay, and then I'll sort of sit there and I'll be like, it takes longer to unpack when it's the first time I'm feeling that and I'm like, oh, Okay, I can't even label that emotion because I think I read somewhere that like in the human vernacular, like they did a study of some proportion of the American population and they could only really label three emotions like anger, sadness and and, and happiness. They didn't really have languaging mm-hmm. for, and I was like, oh, that's, that's, you know, surely that's an American thing. Like <laughs> you know, in Europe, in France, they have words for everything. You know? And that was part of me for my judgment. But nonetheless, I, I, I would recognize when I was sitting with surfing, I was like, oh, like I can feel something, but I don't have a label for what that really is. But I can see that I'm like, there's like something like it feels anxiety sort of like this sort of like that. I didn't really have the word right. for it. And I'd sit with it. And then, like you said, just give it the opportunity to go, okay, that's interesting that that's happening. Observe it, work through it, do the process, and then come out on the other side, return back to the task at hand, realizing that actually I'm not enslaved to that trigger now. And I can, but I noticed over time, the more you spend the time doing that exercise, the time spent surfing the wave actually gets shorter and you can actually dedicate yourself to your task back quicker as well, which is like another amaz- amazing gift that I got out of following your work. Yep. That, that's so true. That's, and that's a fantastic insight. I'm so glad you took that away uh, and that you have a healthy label for those emotions. And I think, unfortunately, you know, many of us are taught that these uncomfortable sensations mean that we're somehow broken, right? That when mm. we feel anxious, we must have a disorder. When we feel distractible, <laughs> well, we must have ADHD. We must have some kind of yeah. uh, thing that needs to be diagnosed. And look, sometimes that is the case. It's about 3% of the population uh, does have ADHD, but th- that means mm. that there's a 97% chance that <laughs> you don't suffer you from don't. One of these disorders. And feeling anxious, feeling distractible is perfectly normal. It is part of the human condition. And look, here's one of my my favorite recent uh, sayings is that pills don't teach skills. Pills don't (laughs) teach skills. That if you're numbing the sensation of anxiety, you you don't necessarily give yourself the opportunity to explore why you're feeling anxious. And of course, bypassing your inner work. 
Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. There's there's information there. We have uncomfortable emotions for a reason. They are messengers trying to tell us to to think about something more in depth. So it's about how you frame that. So for example, I used to have terrible stage fright. And that's a really bad thing what? to feel no, when you're no. a professional public <laughs> speaker. Right? Yeah. Guys, check out some of his TED Talks online. <laughs> Unbelievable. No. Okay, sorry, please. I mean, this is true. Please continue. This is true. And 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 so what did I do with it? Before I, I learned how to manage these sensations and, and, and how to deal with them in a healthy way, I would get into these terrible narratives in my in my own head that, oh, you know, if I'm feeling nervous, if I'm feeling stage fright, that must mean I'm not a real professional and I'm never going to make it in this career. And uh, if I had only prepared more and I'm going to mess up, up. It's going to be awful. And even telling you this now, I can feel myself getting worked up <laughs> because rate. that yeah. was exactly the script I used to follow in my head. And right. people do this all the time. Oh, if I'm getting distracted from that thing, that must mean I really don't want to do it. Right. And it's like not who I really am. And there's some kind of deeper mission that maybe I should go explore instead. And then, you know, five years later, they still haven't done the thing they wanted to do with their time and their yeah. attention and their life. So dealing with it, reshaping it in a healthier way. So for example, what do I say when I go on stage? I still get butterflies in my stomach. I still start sweating. I still have nerves, mm. but I reframed it. Mm. So today, right before I go on stage, when I feel the same exact physical sensation, the same exact physiological response, I've changed the script. Mm -hmm. Now I tell myself, ah, okay, you see the reason my heart is pumping so fast right now mm -hmm. is because my brain needs more oxygen to prepare me to give my best talk. Mm -hmm. So by doing that, by understanding the script that you need to tell yourself when you feel the sensation, you're feeling anxious. Yeah. Okay. So one part could be like, oh, there must be something wrong with me. I need a diagnosis, which sometimes that is the case very rarely for the mm. general population, but sometimes the case more oftentimes it's, you know what, this is something that's really important to me because my I really care about that I want to do a good job on this. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So it's really about the script that we're telling ourselves. That's one of, you know, again, there's about a dozen different techniques we can use around reframing that trigger so that it serves us as opposed to hurts us. Yeah. I think that was one of the, one of my favorite takeaways from the book, the mindset piece as well, even just the piece where you unpacked in the book, like the idea of um, like willpower and the, the, the thought that we have a limited amount of willpower actually led to certain participants in a study behaving in a way that they had limited willpower as opposed to yes. them believing that they had infinite willpower right. to them behaving. Let, like let me unpack it really quick because it, it's such a yeah. good stu study. I don't, I don't want to, I don't yeah. want to go. Don't let me butcher it. Is, it. is it okay if I, I just elaborate <laughs> on that? This, this is a really important one in terms of yeah. not only reimagining the, 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 the trigger, but also reimagining our temperament. And we see this yeah. all the time where people think they are a certain way, right? Yeah. I am a morning person. I am a Sagittarius. I am no good at time management. <laughs> sometimes, and we can get into where it's helpful. Sometimes these labels can be actually very helpful. Yeah. Many times they're hurtful, mm. especially if it's around a self-limiting limiting belief. And yeah. one of the beliefs that I hear way too often is I have a short attention span. I'm no good at time management. Somehow that we're like born out of the womb with, with this, uh, ability. Yeah. <laughs> this is a skill like any, you didn't know how to ride a bike. I was born you highly distractible. Trained, and yet you learn <laughs> these skills, right? It's a learnable yeah. skill, of course. And mm -hmm. so, and so we want to make sure how we, how we talk to ourselves. And, and, and one of the, the, the piece of evidence that I give around this topic is uh, this body of research that came out around what's called ego depletion. Ego depletion mm -hmm. is this idea that willpower is a depletable resource, mm -hmm. that you run out of willpower just like you would run out of charge on your battery, okay? Mm -hmm. That you you run out of it. And, and even if you haven't heard the term ego depletion, you probably yourself or heard someone say something like, oh, I've had such a tough day. Uh, I'm spent, quote unquote, mm -hmm. right? I'm spent. I And I would say this to myself every day. I'd come from work and say, oh, I've had such a hard day. I'm spent. I have no more willpower. Give me that pint of Ben and Jerry's. I'm going to sit on the couch and watch some television, right? When yeah. I said I was going to do something else, I'm not yeah. going to exercise. I'm, I'm, I'm spent. I'm out of willpower. Mm -hmm. And interestingly enough, this idea actually got some, some credibility when a group of researchers actually studied this phenomenon and observed, hey, look, the re the, the, that, that uh, um, willpower does deplete like a battery, like gas in a gas tank. And so this was kind of circulated for a while. It made all the pop psychology books for a time period. And then mm -hmm. as we do in the social sciences, when an idea sounds a little bit fishy, right? It sounds too good to be true. Mm -hmm. What do we do? We don't accept it on faith. We rerun the study. And as far as we can tell, after rerunning these studies again and again, it does appear that willpower as a depletable resource is not true, that there is no such thing as ego depletion. We do not run out of willpower, right? Except, except in one group of people. 
there is one group of people who really do run out of willpower, just like gas in a gas tank. And those people, and only those people, are people who believe that willpower <laughs> is a depletable resource. And so this just goes to show you, again, that when we believe something is, is the case, when we believe that we are a certain thing, when we have a self-limiting belief, we will act in accordance with that belief. As Henry Ford said, whether you believe you can or you cannot, you are right. Absolutely. And so we have to be very careful about these self-limiting beliefs, starting with these beliefs that, oh, I'm no good at time management, or I have an addictive personality, or I have a short attention span, or I have undiagnosed ADHD. Probably not. Yeah. <laughs> right? Chances are yeah. it's not an addiction. It's a distraction. And it's something we can control as long as we believe we can. As soon as we throw out the baby with the bathwater and say, oh, I'm I'm helpless, right? This is, this is not going to work. Well, then of course it's not because you haven't tried any techniques. Yeah, I uh, I love what you're sharing. The only reason I'm cringing is because I know like how many of us tuning in and potentially like I, I can remember this for myself, like just how many places, yeah, in my life, just it's it, the, the low hanging fruit is that self-limiting conversation with yourself and you can catch yourself by the things that you say. It's like, oh, no, I'm no good at that. And it's like, you know, I say this to, I used to say this to my team all the time. It's like, oh, yeah, if you can send off that email for me because I'm the speaker, not the writer. You know, it's just, you know, it's just like, oh man, like the more yeah. you say that, of you need course. to be saying that, bro. <laughs> totally. Like, and yeah. we know why we say, you, I know why you said that. Right? <laughs> like you're the speaker, not the writer, because the writing part sucks. Right? <laughs> <laughs> it's much more fun to do the speaking than the writing for you. And I, I get that. Yeah. But of course, eventually, if you keep doing that, obviously you never become the writer because Absolutely. you don't practice that skill set. Right? Absolutely. And literally the, the thing I just signed up for is copywriting one. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm there working on it. I'm working on it. One of the <laughs> other exercises, just before we veer off the exercises that I found immensely, and I know there's a whole bunch in the book. So obviously this podcast can't be dedicated to the entire it is dedicated to the book but all the exercise in the book but i just have to share for one of my favorite ones and thank you so much for this because it has been oh my god like again <laughs> i don't want to sound like cheesy but it has been a game changer for me which was visualizing the the river and mm. the thoughts as leaves on the mm. river and my compulsion as something sitting on the leaf as it sort of drifts on by I think because I have a propensity for meditation, that visualization is everything. <laughs> it's literally, Beautiful. that was I'm the so biggest takeaway for me from like, other than the traction distraction piece, that was the biggest exercise for me that I can just sort of sit with. And in that time where you go, you know, surf the urge, I feel, but then oftentimes I sort of feel and it's like, oh, this is kind of what's calling me. And I let it, and I visualize it sort of drifting away. And that has mm -hmm. been an amazing exercise for me. I just wanted to sort of pay that homage in this episode, Wonderful. Um, just because it's really helped me out a great deal. Oh, I'm so glad. Yeah, I can't take credit for it. That leaves on a stream technique is again comes from acceptance and commitment therapy. But I, I did want to reverberate it because I think it's a great technique. And, and it is very much like the meditative practice. I think that the, the goal again is to say, I don't have to give in to every little whim, right? Mm -hmm. Every idea that passes through my head, you know, you're, you are not your thoughts. Yeah. <laughs> you don't have to attach yourself to every little uh, whim as you're working. You know, what, what I do, I keep a piece of paper next to my desk, and I just write down that thought so that I don't if it's important to me, and I'll get back to it later. You know why? Because I have time in my schedule to get back to those random ideas a little later. Yeah. Nia, let's circle back. You mentioned we can talk about why to-do lists are not the best productivity tool. Um, talking yeah. about writing things down on pieces of paper, why are to-do lists not uh, the best productivity tool? Sure, sure. So I am an advocate for getting things out of your head and putting them on a piece of paper. That's a yeah, good idea. You don't want to sure. carry around all the million things you need to get done in your day just in your head. That's not what I'm advocating against. That's a good idea. What I'm advocating against is that people stop there. People put this to-do list, you know, they put a million things on a to-do list. And of course, the biggest problem with the to-do list is that there is no constraint. You can add more and more and more as much paper as you have, or as big, you know, your apps are endless. If you have a to-do list app, you can always add more to these things. Mm -hmm. And infinite. the problem is without a, it's exactly, it's infinite. Without some kind of constraint, here's what happens. You're busy all day long. You yeah. feel like you've done a million different things, but you come home from work at the end of the day and you look at your to-do list and here you have all the things that you said you would do that you didn't accomplish. Mm -hmm. Loser. <laughs> and so what this is doing, again, back to self-image, you are proving to yourself here, there's a yeah. physical manifestation. Here's all the things I said I was going to do that I didn't yeah. finish. Day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, you are reinforcing your own self-image of someone who doesn't do what they say they're going to do. You're mm. unreliable to yourself. You're a liar to yourself. 
Mm-hmm. And that begins to take a psychic toll. And this is why people eventually, even after keeping a to-do list, say, well, I must not be good at it. Well, it's nothing yeah. wrong with you. It's something wrong with this crappy technique that people are using. Mm-hmm. Because the thing that's missing from the to-do list is when you are going to do it. So it's much more important to keep a calendar, right? To keep a schedule for when you will do those things. Why? Because a schedule has constraints. Mm-hmm. We all have 24 hours in a day. So what a schedule forces you to do is to acknowledge that you can't do everything. Mm-hmm. It's impossible. You will not be able to do everything. And that's good because <laughs> what that allows you to do is to prioritize. Mm-hmm. So if you don't prioritize, if you don't decide in advance what you will do with your time, again, you can't call something a distraction unless you know what it distracted you from. So by working with that constraint of a calendar, by saying, yes, I need to do this, I need to do that, you're putting it on your calendar. But here's the difference. I don't want you to measure yourself. This is, this is reason number two why to-do lists mm. are so bad for your productivity. To-do lists measure you based on how many cute little boxes you check off. So what do people yeah. do? They add things just for the sake of checking them off, <laughs> right? They, they finish the fun and easy tasks first, right? Yeah. Because it gives them that sense of accomplishment. Yeah. But they leave the hard and important. They don't eat the frog first. <laughs> exactly. I, don't eat, oh, I don't eat the frog first. I shouldn't say that. Yeah. So, so by, by not doing that, by not uh, 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 prioritizing what comes first, mm-hmm. second, third, you're, you're kind of letting yourself off the hook here. And so by putting mm-hmm. it in your schedule, as mm-hmm. opposed to just doing them whenever you feel like it, which what do we do? We do the easy stuff. We do the urgent stuff as opposed to doing the hard and important work we have to do to move our lives and career forward. That's that's a, a big mistake on these to-do lists as well. So by having that time in your calendar, when you know this is important for me and you're not measuring yourself by did I finish? Now, this is super, super important. Mm-hmm. You do not measure yourself by whether you finished. I don't care if you finished, okay? What I want mm-hmm. you to do instead is to measure yourself based on one thing and one thing only. Not the to-do list technique that, oh, as long as I check the box, I, I get a gold star, right? I get, no, 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 no. What I want you to do instead is measure yourself by one thing, which is, did I work on what I said I was going to work on or did I do what I said I was going to do for as long as I said I would without distraction? That's it. That's the only criteria. It doesn't matter if you finish. It's simply, did I do what I said I was going to do for as long as I said I would without distraction? Why? Here's the kicker. People who use that technique, people who use time boxing and measure themselves simply based on whether they could work without distraction, finish more. They actually get more done than people who use the to, the to-do list technique because now they have feedback. The, one of the biggest problems with to-do lists is that there's no feedback mechanism, right? If it says, uh, finish my novel, that's you know, top of my to-do list, finish my novel. Well, Six months later. <laughs> How long does it take me to write a page? How long does it take yeah. me to write a chapter? No idea. <laughs> mm. Whereas when you say to yourself, look, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to work on my novel for 20 minutes today. Yeah. 20 minutes. How far did I get? Right. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, t- with 20 minutes, I did about half a page. Terrific. So if my novel is going to be 300 pages, I know I need this much time if I want to finish it by this deadline. Mm-hmm. Now you have a feedback system as mm-hmm. opposed to to-do list. There's no feedback, which is why we have uh, this problem where we know that studies have, have found it's called a planning fallacy that on average, a task takes people three times longer than they estimate on average, mm-hmm. because we don't have data to tell us how long things take. There's no feedback loop. So that's the second big problem. The third big problem with to-do lists Hmm. is that it doesn't let you enjoy the limited leisure time you do have. Here's the problem, especially with high performers. You come home from work and all you want to do is is veg out, be with Mm -hmm. your kids, watch some Netflix, have dinner, relax, right? Mm. But you've got this stupid to-do list in the back (laughs) of your head of all these things you haven't finished. So even when you just want to play with your kids, even when you just want to watch a movie, even when you just want to relax, you're thinking about, oh, I'm supposed to be doing X, Y, Z. Mm-hmm. As opposed to a person who uses a time box calendar has on their calendar, spend time with the kids, mm-hmm. watch a movie, scroll Netflix, uh, scroll Facebook, doesn't matter. It's in their calendar to enjoy leisure time. And then that mm-hmm. becomes traction, right? Mm-hmm. You love going on Instagram, great. Put it on your calendar and now you can enjoy it without guilt because now yeah. that has become traction. Mm-hmm. And anything else, even doing work stuff or whatever it is, now that becomes distraction. So 
very few people listening have actually felt what real leisure time feels like because they don't plan that time. They expect to feel leisure at some time or another. And, and yet even the leisure time they have doesn't feel good because their mind is somewhere else. They're th still and, thinking about their to-do list. And we're squeezing it in, I feel like. I remember like you're trying to like, oh yeah, there's that guilty pleasure of the entrepreneur. It's like, oh, you know, yeah, yeah, I got Sunday to myself, you know? <laughs> it's like, it, it, there's like this guilt associated to actually taking yeah, the time off yeah. that you really Whereas could be, should it, be enjoying. Yeah, absolutely. I, I plan, you know, and, and you say, oh, that sounds very rigid. I don't know if I can plan every minute of my day. It doesn't mean you have to plan down to the second. For example, mm -hmm. on weekends, uh, you know, I, I spend with my daughter of afternoon every weekend. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know what we're going to do at that time. Maybe yeah. we're going to go to the museum. Maybe we're going to go to the park. Maybe we'll go get some ice cream. I don't know what we're going to do that time. <laughs> Why do I block out that time, that four hours of time? I block out that time so I know what I will not be doing. Yeah. Right. I will not be on social media. I will not be defending. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So you can plan for whatever you want. You want to play the guitar? Awesome. You want to play video games? Great. Put it in your calendar and then you can enjoy it without thinking you're supposed to be somewhere else. Yeah, I love that. And the domains I've picked up from the book, um, and you can affirm, reaffirm this for us or add more to it if you, if you wish, um, were uh, time blocks for yourself, time blocks for your relationships, and time blocks for your work. If, exactly. If those are the three domains, why are those three domains? You found those to be the most important? Yeah, I, I put those into, I, I tried to think of all the different things that people would want in their life, uh, mm -hmm. all their different values. And so yeah. those were the the three life domains that I could fit everything in. So first, you have to start with you. Many mm -hmm. people, by the way, do this in reverse, and it's it's wrong, right? First, they'll say, well, I have to do work. And they'll, put, <laughs> they'll fill up their day with work stuff. And I think it's actually yeah. the opposite. But if you don't take care of yourself, you can't take care of others, you can't make the world a better place. Mm -hmm. So first, you have to take care of yourself. And, mm -hmm. and how do you do that? You look to your values. What are values? values or attributes of the person you want to become. Mm -hmm. So you have to ask yourself, how would the person I want to become spend their time taking care of themselves? Mm -hmm. Okay. How much time would the person you want to become spend reading, meditating, praying, uh, anything that you, that you find is fulfilling for you, taking care mm -hmm. of personal hygiene, right? Well, all those things need to be in your calendar. You know, we, we, we're, those of us who are parents, you know, I used to tell my kid, uh, you, know, you have to go to bed on time. Sleep is super important. But I didn't have a bedtime, right? Meanwhile. I wasn't in my calendar. I was a hypocrite. So now I have a bedtime in my schedule when I will go to bed. Why do I have that time? So I know, okay, if I want to go to bed a certain time, that means I need to shower. I need to uh, brush my mm -hmm. teeth. I need to do all this stuff. I need time in my calendar to make sure that if I want to get to bed at a certain time, I have to do all the pre-bed stuff yeah. at a certain time. Mm -hmm. So having that stuff for yourself, super important. Again, I'm not telling you what to do, right? Mm. Uh, some people love to exercise. Some people don't like to exercise. Totally up to you. But mm. if that is important to you, it's not just going to have, put it on your calendar. So that's mm. you. That's the you life domain. Next comes relationships. And part of the reason we have an epidemic of loneliness uh, in, in the industrialized world today is that our institutions that used to give people regular interactions with members of their community are disappearing. Uh, as, as the industrialized world becomes more and more secular, people don't have the church group. People don't have the Kiwanis club. They don't have the bowling group. They don't have those regular yeah. times in their schedule to meet with people. Mm -hmm. Uh, we give people whatever remnants and scraps of time are left over for our friends, for our spouse, for our, our relationships. And that's a big mistake. Mm -hmm. Put time in your calendar. Let me give you one example. So I have three of my very best friends that a few mm -hmm. years ago when I was doing this research, uh, you know, we were having this, this problem that these were people that I really wanted to stay in touch with. And yet, mm -hmm. you know, every time we would try and contact each other, it would be like, okay, what about the, this Wednesday or no, yeah. that doesn't work. Okay. What about Friday? Well, no, that's not really good. And we would spend more time planning the time to get together and talk, uh, than actual time itself. Mm -hmm. So here's what I did. I said, look, these are three people that I want in my life. They mm -hmm. are part of my relationship network. I don't want to fall. By, by the way, if you don't do this, you know what happens. You lose touch with somebody and then it gets kind of awkward because if you were such close friends, why is it taking you a year to get back in touch, mm -hmm. right? So you start doubting the relationship. It's, it's horrible. It's very toxic. Yeah. Instead, what I did, I said, look, this is totally cool if you don't want to do this, but you are somebody who's important to me. I want you in my life. Can we put a time in the calendar every, mo uh, every month to talk? Okay. And by the way, I live in Singapore. They live all over the world. I have a friend in Israel. I have a friend in, in Los Angeles. I have a friend in Washington. They're all over the place. All of them said yes, thankfully. And so now we spend no time planning. I know that the the the, the third Tuesday of the month, okay, that's my time with Travis. That's mm. going to be the time when we have a, 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 I sent him a calendar invite and we always know it's time mm. that we both blocked out from 
from today until eternity, yeah. we have that time on our schedule. Mm-hmm. So having that time with your with your spouse, with your significant other, with your kids, having mm-hmm. that planned time, that quality time is not going to happen unless we plan for it. So that's the relationship domain. And then finally, the work domain. Mm-hmm. And work falls into two categories. We have what we call reactive work, mm-hmm. which is the, the work you know, where we're reacting to things, reacting to emails, reacting to phone calls, reacting Requests. to meetings. Yeah. Yes, that, that's important. That's part of everybody's day. But then there's this other kind of work that tends to get crowded out, which is called reflective work. Mm -hmm. So most people default into the reactive work. Why? Because it's relatively easy. You get told what to do, Mm -hmm. right? I don't know what to do right now. Let me check my email inbox. Let me, let me see what meeting I'm supposed to go to. Let me see who needs me as opposed to reflective work is the kind of work that can only be done without distraction. So high performers across the board are people who make time in their day for reflective work. And look, it can be 20 minutes, 30 minutes, maybe an hour of time to think. And you cannot think if you're constantly pinged and dinged every 30 seconds. You Dude. have to have the time to plan, to strategize, to be creative, to think for God's sakes, it has to be done without distraction. If you do not make that time in your day, I promise you, you are going to run real fast in the wrong direction. So put at least some time in your day for that reflective work and it has to be scheduled and it has to be protected religiously. Yeah. I love that. So there's a few things that have helped me on that journey, understanding that as well, that I've applied to that. Um, Cal Newport, deep work, the reflective work that you're mm-hmm. reflecting to, he talks about only doing one or two or th- at most three things a day if you're a master. Right. And that was a huge piece for me. So I actually, for my reflective stuff, like I generally try and only do one, like when we set a task and I love the distillation of actually only committing to the amount of time allotted to the task, because somehow that slipped past me. I was always trying to do a thing like, but I was always very conscious of trying to allocate a thing that I could complete in that day. But I always gave myself just one thing to do a day because of what you mentioned earlier on in the piece around that it becomes a habit forming identity. It's like, actually, I get shit done. I'm the kind of guy that gets shit done as opposed to having right. every entrepreneur that I coach, the to-do list never gets shorter, man. It just gets longer and longer and longer until you sort of go, I'm closing the book on that one, starting another yeah. one, you know? It's, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, it never ends. So that piece of focusing on just one thing um, for a given period of time has been huge for me in terms of my productivity and yeah. using the time yeah. blocking, uh, time boxing has been um, in- incredible for that. One of the other things that... Um, when I first started introducing this to some of my coaching clients, because they, you know, the morning morning rituals are, are so evangelized in personal development as well. And someone will be like, hey, I want to really start a more morning ritual. What should be in it? And, mm-hmm. you know, it was beautiful because I had just come across this work at that point and I realized, actually, it doesn't matter what's in it, bro. Mm-hmm. And they were like, what do you mean? Should I be meditating? Should I be doing my yoga? Should I be going for my walks? Should I be walking the dog? Should I be journaling? Should I be stretching? Should I be? And it was like, I could see the to-do list for the morning yeah, ritual coming yeah. out. And I was like, actually, you know what would be amazing is if you just set aside an hour for yourself every morning and some mornings you could journal and some mornings you could meditate and some mornings you could stretch, some mornings you could walk the dog. And I think that was just to sort of, I just really wanted to share that because for those tuning in to this particular juncture of the podcast, you'll be listening and going, hey, <laughs> Like regiment, like planning out my entire schedule is so regimented. I'm not in the military, go away, near, go away, hammer it, right? <laughs> but there's such an opportunity to make it hyper flexible in that way. It's like, actually, I just know I wake up, I've got an hour to me, you know? Totally. Um, and that gives you so much freedom to dead it, like know that you're being nourished by yourself, but then also to go and explore that creatively to give it what you need it to be as well. So yeah, I just, I just really wanted to share that piece in that. That's a great, great point. You hit on a few really important points that, first of all, that this is not meant to be uh, a drill sergeant. The, the, the attitude <laughs> here should not be of a drill sergeant. The attitude should be a scientist. Mm. That, as you said, there is no perfect morning routine that applies to everyone. It's you, the best routine is the one you keep. Yeah. And so the idea here is that a, what does a scientist do? A scientist mm-hmm. makes a hypothesis, runs an experiment, looks at the results and then runs another study based on those results. And so what you want to do is say, okay, here's my template for the day. Okay. For the day ahead. Okay. So tomorrow morning, here's what I want to do. Try it. You see how it goes and you Mm -hmm. make adjustments accordingly. Now, what you don't want to do is to abandon it in the moment. 
Mm-hmm. That's a mistake. If you know the going gets tough, you don't get going. What you do instead is you say, okay, let me finish this day as I planned, right? Don't ever break that rule. But mm-hmm. then tomorrow you can completely change the schedule and make it something totally different, right? Mm-hmm. Maybe you find that you're most creative and you love doing writing uh, first thing in the morning or maybe last thing at night, or you like to exercise, you know, what it doesn't matter. It doesn't mm-hmm. matter when you do these things. And there is no perfect schedule for everyone. It's about experimenting to find what works for you and then mm-hmm. seeing, okay, you know what? Where I put this, I didn't really like, but I'm going to change it for the next day. What you don't want to do is to change it in the moment. And and by the way, this other technique that you mentioned is super, super helpful. What many folks do is to say, okay, you know what? I'm going to have that hour of me time. So me time, as we said, you know, that you domain, the things that, that are values that you have, how the person you want to become takes care of themselves. As you said, maybe you have this menu of things that you can take care of yourself. So you could meditate, exercise, or whatever Mm. in that me time. But that's part of what you said you were going to do. And then you might want to talk about the things that you are definitely not going to do, right? Mm. I'm not going to scroll social media, for example, Mm -hmm. in that time. Uh, Why? Social media time is coming later in the day, for example. But it's really about, about following through on your intentions. That's what separates traction from distraction. Yeah. Thank you so much, brother. I I just can't even, like, the book you've written is amazing, guys. Please check out, like, we've just scratched the surface of what's in the book. It's really been one that's really sunk in really deep for me and really helped me with my productivity. And as a coach, you know, especially as a life coach, you're helping people make the most of their lives. And, you know, attention, focus, you know, as sex, as... I don't want to say it's not sexy while you're here. <laughs> it may not be the sexiest topic. You make it look sexy. You look very good on camera. <laughs> Thank you. Stop talking, Amrit. Um, but, but you know, there's there's that sort of it's 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 it, it it can be it can feel heavy to sort of unpack some of that stuff. And the book really makes it very accessible. It's a short short audio book, five and a half hours. Really cuts to the chase, and it, it's staged out really well. And it's got near narrating it, um, which as you've tuned into the podcast very engaging i found it really really accessible and the tools were very practical and very takeawayable and i could really just apply them immediately to my life and i found them very useful so you've tuned into some of them here near thank you so much for sharing yourself and the tools here with us i will put a link to the book in the show notes below for people to tune into and download as well man i just on behalf of myself and the inspired evolution audience just really want to thank you for today's conversation but also all the uh, all the time spent that informed everything that uh built into this conversation today all the research i really appreciate it thank you so much again for having me it was a real pleasure thank you oh my god hey guys if you enjoyed this video give it a like leave us a comment and if you want to stay in tune for every, the new episodes launching every monday hit subscribe and i'll see you in the next video stay inspired to evolve